Um, welcome to uh, the Scottish Parliament and welcome to this event. Uh, I almost made the mistake of saying good morning because we always have a committee meeting in the morning and we had one this morning that lasted quite a while um, and it seems to have been a, a, a day of meeting. So and what, if I could, first of all, I'd just go through a few practical points, uh, if I may. First of all, um, those of you that rely on mobile, mobile telephones, could you make sure they're on silent um, so they don't interrupt us at all? There are toilets outside. Um, and when it comes to the chance for people to speak, if you could try and catch my eye, and I'll indicate you. And what, what, what I'd try and do is get as many of you involved in the conversation as possible. And I've taken the uh, step of following a, the deputy presiding officer. And if I wag a pen like that, it means you're coming to the end of your time. And, and if you ignore it, 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 it comes closer to you and eventually comes very close to you, and that's the indication that you have definitely run out of time. Um, if, I, if I could ask, uh, just remind those people who are sitting around the table, the microphones are activated by the gentleman over there, and, and you don't need to push anything. And if you're not at the table and you want to speak, there are ro roving microphones, and I would ask you to speak very clearly into them. Could I also just say to you, it really helps me because I'm appallingly bad at names and, and faces and remembering uh, where you all come from and who you represent. So if you could introduce yourself on, on where you are, um, sorry, who you're representing and who you are, that'd be very useful. Um, we, we will be taking photos um, during this event, which we will be putting on our website. <laughs> It's part of the uh, consultation process. We like to show that we've involved people. If for some reason you don't want your photograph taken, uh, if you could let a member of the team know, um, uh, that would be good. Uh, now, just really, if I may, um, <clears throat> just explain briefly the background to the bill and the role the committee's doing in this event. The committee's considering the Transport Scotland bill and our role really is to scrutinise the proposals that are laid out in the bill. And we, we do that by taking evidence and considering different views. And this event is really important to us to, to get a wide range of views as possible because it's not possible to get everyone in every evidence session. Um, uh, we, we don't um, come to a formal committee view on the bill until we give our, till our evidence gathering is, is complete and we've drafted our stage one report which we then submit to the parliament and, and that really indicates whether we agree the general principles of the bill. Now we've got seven members of the committee here um, this evening to hear your views and they're lined up there and, and you should be able to see their names. Uh, first of all as the part of the evening we're going to hear from four academics um, and they have been given a very tight time schedule um, to, to talk to. Uh, first of all, there's uh, Professor Ian Doherty uh, from the University of Glasgow. Doctor, uh, they're not in the same order. That, that, that just confuses me. Uh, there's Dr. Kate, the clerks do this occasionally just to keep me on my toes. Dr. Kate Pangborn, um, who's, who's from the University of Leeds. Professor Tom Rye, who's Edinburgh Napier University and Dr. Jonathan Cowie from Edinburgh uh, Napier University. And they're going to have five minutes to give their views, and we'll just go through them, I think, in the order that they're sat here. And then we've got about an hour and a quarter for discussion and to hear your views on the bill. Um, now, I'd like to say, if I may, just without taking up too much more time, the bill covers very specific topics. And one of the things that we found quite difficult uh, when taking evidence is there's a lot of things that people would like to see in the bill um, that aren't in the bill and they suddenly start talking about them and 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 I, I will try if that happens to rein you back politely so we stay on the topic of, of the bill and we're going to concentrate really on the four areas um, that seem to be generating the low in uh, the most interest that is pavement and double parking bus services low emission zones and smart ticketing and if we've got time, we might take an opportunity to cover things that people feel are missing from the bill, but we'll do that at the end. Um, and we're aiming to finish at about... 
aiming to finish at eight o'clock. Um, and uh, if you want to stay and have a chat, uh, there will be some members of the committee who have to go to other events and other programme things that will have gone, but there will be some members of the committee here, and, and it's always a good chance to, to um, I was going to say bend their ears, but, but give them informed discussion of your views on the bill. So I don't want to take any longer. I'd just like to just ask each of uh, the academics, starting with Ian Doherty, um, to give their five minutes worth, and, and I will be watching you for your five minutes, Ian, because uh, you're going to set the scene for the rest. So, Ian, if you'd like to lead off. Thank you very much. Um, convener, members, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you for five minutes and stay relevant and on topic. <laughs> There's two challenges for academics. Um, I'm going to try and limit my comments to the, the four um, main themes which are listed in the the documents. I should, of course, say that these are my personal comments. They don't reflect any of the hats that I may wear in other meetings, be that the Scott Rail Board as a non-executive director of that, or the chair of the Strathclyde Bus Quality Partnership, um, or indeed the deputy chair of the Glasgow Connectivity Commission, um, whose report is due in a few weeks and may have many things to say which are of relevance to the uh, issues contained in the bill. Um, let me start with buses. Um, I think that arresting the decline in bus patronage is probably the single most important thing we can do in the transport domain to help meet the overall social and economic policy aspirations of the Scottish Government and Parliament, particularly inclusive growth, access to employment, um, and so on. So um, this bill is an opportunity to do something about that, and I think we should not fail to take that opportunity. Um, there are a range of views about the best structure for the bus industry, um, which is what's really uh, at the heart of this bill, and I think reading between the lines, that's where the conversation will probably go. I take a pragmatic view of this, I think, in that there, are more than, there is more than one way to organise the bus industry in terms of the mix of ownership and regulatory control between public and private sectors. Um, I also think it's probably true that the empirical evidence across the UK in the generally deregulated environment says that Competition for the bus market has been generally more successful than competition in the market or on street. There are some exceptions to that rule, but I think overall that um, position has some evidence to back it up. So when I read um, the bill and the commentary on it, uh, I'm immediately drawn to the question of, will we end up with something that looks more like a London-type regulated structure at the end of this process <clears throat> than we have today? Um, I guess that's the big decision that we've all got to make. Um, I remain unconvinced, I think, by the evidence to date, particularly about um, whether that will be affordable to the public purse or not. And I know that Tom has done some work in this and may have um, some more detailed and expert views um, on that than I do. But one thing that does worry me about the transition to a more regulated system is whether our local authorities, who would be charged with operating that system, have got the skills to make it work and whether um, we should be asking them to take on the risk that might be involved to the public purse in so doing that. Um, low emission zones, I'm one of those people who comes from the view that we should be doing a lot more, a lot more quickly to improve our environmental performance. Um, when I read about low emission zones, my initial reaction is to say hurrah, except then I look at the detail and think, well, how much difference is this actually going to make, given how many caveats already appear to be um, in the legislation? The two that I point out, um, first of all, are the length of the grace period. Um, I'm one of these other difficult people who still believes in the concept of caveat emptor, and that if you have bought a dirty, polluting diesel car, and the evidence about its impact on public health becomes um, as strong as it has done, then we should probably be encouraging you not to drive that car more quickly, rather than the five or six years it might take for you to not be allowed to do so in a low emission zone in Scotland. Secondly, there's then the provision that says that LEZs must not apply to special roads or motorways. Um, a city 45 miles away from here has several rather large motorways which carry the majority of its traffic and create probably the majority of its local air pollution. And so for the geography of Glasgow, I don't really think that that's a credible position for the bill to take. On ticketing, um, some of you may know that I was a non-executive director of Transport Scotland for a few years, um, between 2006 and 2010. One of the responsibilities I had then was to sit on the Smart Ticketing Project Board. 
Um, I don't think we're very much further forward to delivering the kind of smart ticketing we all would like than we were then. This probably should tell us something about the regulatory complexity of the different networks and modes that we have across Scotland. Um, and again, when I look at the bill, I think this is all well and good, but it's got a kind of 2006 to 10 ring about it. Uh, and technology has somewhat moved on. Um, the idea that somehow a simple plastic card is smart, I think, is rather outdated. And I think we should be much more ambitious um, with what we seek to do about ticketing. I don't for a second underestimate how difficult that would be, given the different regulatory frameworks or different modes we've got and the way we price them. Um, so, for example, given a season ticket between Glasgow and Edinburgh, and the railways now costs £2,300, not more than that, £3,200, um, we've created a, a, a gradient between different modes that makes genuinely integrated ticketing of the kind that we immediately think we would like, that we see when we travel to London or to the Netherlands or elsewhere, difficult to do in reality, but we should probably take some steps towards doing that. Um, and I've left the one which exercises me most to last, which is pavement or responsible parking. I'd much rather see this couched in terms of pedestrians' rights, please. Um, I don't see why a pedestrian should have any fewer rights to use the pavement than somebody um, having an Amazon delivery of a gadget they don't really need. <laughs> I think that tells us something about our priorities in um, society. I mean, I, I became militant about this when I became a parent and I started shoving my kids around in a pram. Um, and when you do that, you really begin to realise how little people care about the pavement and pedestrians and the ability that we have to walk around. So I think about 20 minutes and I look at uh, Glasgow City Centre, where I often am in the morning and the peak of the delivery cycle, and I'd see vans parked on pavements or in cycle lanes or elsewhere, five metres from an empty loading bay. And I think, how will the bill stop that? We're not very good at enforcing the regulations we already have, so how can we be confident that we'll be able to enforce any new regulations any better um, than we currently have? So this is one area where I would like us to be much, much bolder and much more ambitious, because after all, we all know that at the very top of the transport hierarchy comes a pedestrian, and my request would be that we should treat them with the respect they deserve, please. And you stopped me becoming too militant when you went over time, so we're going to move straight on. Um, to Kate and Kate, five minutes. Okay, thank you very much to you, convener, and to members and visitors for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, I'm also commenting in an individual capacity, but I would like to point out that I am a Scottish citizen and I live in Aberdeenshire. So, although my affiliation is the University of Leeds, I have been here for 34 years. Um, so, um, uh, is, Ian is very difficult to follow because he used, steals all my material every time. Uh, so I shall do my best to say something slightly different. Um, yeah, there, a lot of what, uh, what Ian said I, I do agree with, um, but I might express it in a slightly different way. Um, and I'm not sure where to start, but I think I would like to start with um, low emission zones um, and I think there are sort of some key tests which I think this bill ought to pass and firstly in relation to uh, overall and with reference to the LEZs in particular will it deliver modal shift or low carbon benefits on a scale to meet the Scottish Government's climate change targets which are uh, very um, ambitious and uh, that is made all the more important by the recent IPCC report which shows us that we have got a very short time globally in which to turn the ship around. Um, so um, in relation to whether I think low emission zones are a good idea notwithstanding the fact that the technical details of them are quite difficult um, as the reviews of existing LEZs show they don't always deliver um, such a big um, reduction in emissions as might be hoped. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that um, the Euro 6 standard um, is not so good on nitrogen oxide um, emissions as earlier vehicle standards, although it is much better on the particulate matter. And particulate matter is a bit, very important um, element of air pollution to reduce. Um, both of them are, but that one in particular, because I think with relation to soot and black carbon, it has been recently showed that 
um, the smallest particles can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is a very, potentially a very serious public health problem. Um, but um, nitrogen oxides as well are also very seriously um, implicated in respiratory problems. And there has been a recent case, which many of you are probably aware of, um, in which an individual death has been correlated to spikes in air pollution. A child in London uh, residence was in an air quality management zone, um, and her hospital admissions could be correlated to pollutions in air, sorry, spikes in air pollution. Um, and I think that's very sobering, and we should all be very aware of that. But in relation to low emission zones, uh, there's a number of issues that we need to be aware of. Um, firstly, for the technical reasons and the fact that it's, Scotland's got quite a small population, um, the setting of vehicle bans or exemptions, it really needs to be done at a national level. So it's a sing single understanding across freight industry and individuals and the bus industry of what's allowed into an LEZ zone without contravening. The actual design of timings and all the rest of it, that could be at the local level, but the, the, the technical details of engine types should be national. Um, plus, the, the zones need to be embedded within a, a, a much broader geography um, so that the benefits don't just accrue within the zones which have the air quality problems, but that they uh, don't penalise the people that live outside the zones that they have enough time to make the adaptations. I take Ian's point about caveat emptor, but I would also point out that from a social inclusion point of view, those with the least money tend to be forced to have the cars with the worst pollution attributes because they're <coughs> buying second-hand vehicles. Um, so measures need to be taken to ensure that they can clean up their act at not, and are supported to do that, that it's not too expensive. Um, and the grace periods are the time that should be used to put in place alternatives for those people who live outside the zone so they can get into the zone without contravening it, without being dependent on their cars, and so that the benefits are felt outside the zone as well as within the zone. Um, I think also, Ellie said, frankly, they're not just about air quality. They're also about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's another kind of emissions. We should include reduction of those as objectives of LEZs, as well as reducing overall traffic to improve urban livability and attractiveness. Um, That's your five minutes, Kate. But if, 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 you, if, if, you, you know, if there's a, a punchy point on each of the others, I'm happy to take a punchy point on each of I the might other. get an opportunity to insert those later. I'm, I'm sure you will. Um, yeah. Tom. OK, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I should also say that I believe I'm here on, partly on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Highway and, Highways and Transportation, uh, who were invited but couldn't come along on this occasion. Right, first of all, um, low emission zones. All I would say is that the evidence from the uh, literature demonstrates that they, and this, this is shown in the consultation document, that they haven't made that much of an impact elsewhere in Europe um, where they've been implemented. The best evaluations have been done in Germany and there we saw sort of see sort of 4% uh, reductions in the uh, key pollutant concent concentrations. So clearly not enough to meet the thresholds, which su suggests that while LEZs are welcome and indeed could be implemented under existing legislation, although this legislation sets, proposed legislation sets a national framework, um, they're very welcome, but clearly there's also a need to uh, reduce vehicle miles travelled if we're going to deal with um, <clears throat> these pollution problems. Secondly, smart ticketing. Um, I maybe build a little bit on, on, on what uh, uh, Ian said. Um, I think smart ticketing has its advantages, but if it's not coupled with attractive pricing, it's not really going to make the difference uh, to the use of public transport uh, that it would if it is coupled to smart to, to, to attractive pricing. So the key things about countries that have higher levels of public tri transport ridership than ours is that those smart tickets where they have them are attractively priced, particularly for um, monthly, weekly or monthly season tickets. Um, 
Why can they do that? Because of the regulatory framework that they have, because they're operating their regional and local public transport systems, usually on what's known as a uh, gross cost basis. Uh, the public authority keeps the revenue uh, itself and simply pays the operators to operate the service and give them some incentives, and that makes the integrated ticket far easier to deliver. So I don't think we should confound smart ticketing with integrated ticketing necessarily or expect that smart ticketing on its own will deliver the benefits that integrated ticketing does and is perhaps is what we really want. Um, bus services, yeah. Um, there's been a stunning lack of the use of the powers in the 2001 Transport Scotland Act on bus services. That is uh, information. Um, integrated ticketing, funnily enough, uh, statutory quality partnerships and statutory quality contracts. And um, I think there's a number of reasons that they haven't been used, those powers haven't been used, and those reasons will not go away with this new legislation. Um, the legislation perhaps fails to take account of the power balance in the industry between local authorities and very large multinational um, bus companies who will maybe enter into a partnership only where and when it suits them. Um, but I would also say in defence of the bus companies that it's not just the regulatory framework that's causing problems and reductions in numbers of passengers, it's also congestion. That's a major issue why bus services are having problems. And here I would uh, maybe incur Ed's wrath by mentioning something that's not in the bill, but could be, which of course is a parking levy, which in, introduced in Nottingham has been shown to reduce congestion compared to comparable cities around England. There needs to be some form of demand management in this bill, and at the moment there is not. Um, the other thing is if company, sorry, if local authorities or SPT wanted to franchise services, I think they would need access to um, route level data. Uh, in order to build the business case for the franchising agreement. This was a major reason why Nexus in Newcastle could not build a sound business case for their quality contract application and why it therefore fell. Therefore, the bill should incorporate some mechanism whereby that could take place for the business case to be built. Um, and then finally, on footway parking, um, the, the proposed legislation appears to have been lifted completely from the 1975 Greater London Act Section 15, which I'm sure you all will have read, um, <clears throat> apart from the 20-minute loading um, exemption. And I, too, have significant doubts about this. We did some re research uh, here in Edinburgh looking at the enforcement of existing loading restrictions, not on the footway, but uh, just on the street, and we found that... Um, yeah, uh, a vehicle illegally loading uh, had a chance of being moved on or, or fined of between 5% and 0% on main streets compared to 17% on residential streets. So there's a problem with the enforcement of loading restrictions and I think giving this 20 minute, enshrining in law the 20 minute uh, thing will make it even more difficult to enforce even where there are decriminalised parking enforcement regimes. How's my time? You, that's why the pens were... Sorry, yeah, I'd forgotten you. about the pen thing. All right. OK. So that's uh, pretty much... The pen thing's critical. All I've, time's up. All I've got to say <laughs> for now. OK, thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll move on to Jonathan Carey, uh, who I think is just going to cover specifically bus regulation. Yes, that's right. Uh, I, was, I was going to talk about actual buses. Uh, when I look at that, I mean, I guess I'll jump straight to the Bus Sales Improvement Partnership Scheme. Um, when I read that, obviously the idea of partnership, and I think bus companies and local authorities working in partnership is something that is to be very much encouraged. Uh, and certainly, but in terms of the, uh, the actual bill, I mean, I accept that a lot is maybe in the detail on how these things actually work, but the bill, when you actually look at the bill, it doesn't say a great deal about partnership. Um, it, it does give a lot, of, or, or potentially give a lot of statutory powers to local authorities uh, to basically regulate bus companies. And that seems, I mean, like if you're a cynic, I suppose you say that they'll basically tell them what to do. And there's no real freedom there for actual bus companies to contribute to an actual partnership. It is, it is full economic regulation. That, that's what is being proposed in, in, in the most kind of severe terms. Um, and, and I think I would like to see more um, in terms of genuine partnership and those opportunities, because so it's not about, I say, 
I do confess, or at least I do admit, a lot of it is in how these things may actually work. But in terms of the bill, it's not really a partnership, um, it's economic regulation. Uh, one thing, again, to, to incur your wrath, uh, is one thing I like to see in the partnership is more kind of legislative powers outside of the bus industry. I absolutely agree with Tom, as in, I think more needs to be done in, in terms of traffic management, those sorts of things, and that is causing problems for, for buses. And, and I know that's an option, but in terms of a formal part of the partnership, I think it's something that I would like to, I'd like to see in the bill. Uh, in terms of the franchising, um, I'm not sure if I should say what I'm about to say, but I guess I'll, I guess I'll say it. Uh, I am very doubtful about the actual, about the actual proposals. Uh, you can regulate an industry, but what you, you can never really get away from are the basic economics of that industry and what's happening in that industry. And if you try and impose a regulatory framework on an industry which won't actually bear the kind of economics of it, it's simply not going to work. And you are going to potentially have a lot of problems, a lot of operators leaving, those sorts of things. Uh, in terms of profit margins, I mean, if you speak about profit margins, a bus company, it's an Alan's briefing paper, uh, is 8%. Uh, there's some variability in that in, in different companies, but there's not a lot to squeeze out there. And I think the, the realities of, of providing bus services in Scotland are, are very different, well, in Britain, outside of London, are very different to how they were in 1985 and things have, have moved on. I mean, I don't know if I should say this again, but the happy times if like, for the bus companies have, have gone. That, that, that's not the case anymore. It is, in some environments, it is a very challenging environment. And if you try and impose a regulatory framework on top of that, it's, it's just not going to work. And I suppose, to actually pick some things out, I mean, 13A5B, not that I've read the bill at all, um, says that the actual basis of these franchises will be on the making of payments by persons undertaking to provide the service to the authority. Uh, that assumes there's, there's excess profitability, which there isn't. There's also issues there about, well, even, even if that was possible, is that the best way to do it? Because that's a tax on bus users. So that's actually potentially a regressive measure. So, so I think there's, I, I just don't see franchising work. And then I guess the last thing is it also completely ignores the idea of bus territories. You can remove the market, but you, you, you're not taking away the territory. <clears throat> We're in Edinburgh. If you want extensive bus contracting in Edinburgh, there's one bus company in Edinburgh who will bid for those contracts. Uh, that represents a major, major barrier to entry. No other bus company is in a position to actually do that. So I guess the question is, would you end up with anything better than you've got already? And I would strongly suggest the answer is no. And then to agree with Ian and Tom, and in, in terms of financing, abilities, skills, uh, you, you're taking the whole kind of planning function, no kind of strategic function, you're taking, are you taking that out of the private sector where it is at the moment and bring it into the public sector? Uh, that, again, that's, that's, uh, that's going to be extremely costly. And if anything, I would predict bus fares. Will, I mean, bus fares have risen in this country, but they've risen for good reason, and it's not excess profitability. So I think there, I'll, I'll stop, is that my five minutes? Yeah, absolutely. You're on time. The only oh, one that was. Um, so, <laughs> congratulations. You, you don't incur my wrath, which, despite what you and, 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 and Tom have said, is, is not that fearful. Can I just say, in advance of this session, the committee received quite a lot of uh, input from you as attendees, uh, which outlined questions, comments and issues and challenges that you had in relation to the bill. And so, to try and make sure we covered all those as best possible, We've tried to summarise them within a set of discussion points, which I think have been circulated to you all in advance, and there are actually copies here. So we're, we're actually going to deal with parking, bus services, low emission zones and smart ticketing, as we discussed. And what I'll do is, at the start of each section, briefly explain what I believe the bill does, and then we'll d select a discussion point from the list to get us started, and then open it up to the floor. Um, I want this to be as free-flowing as possible, um, so the committee members can hear as much of what you've got to say as possible. And if they want to further question, I'll obviously look to, the, to, to bring them in. But really, it's, it, it's your meeting's discussion point. So let's start with parking. Uh, the part of the bill that uh, would introduce uh, prohibitions on parking on the pavement and double parking. There are a number of exemptions, and which you're aware about. Perhaps uh, just to kick things off, um, We've heard about the fact that in the bill there's an intention to give an exemption for delivery vehicles in relation to pavement parking. Who has views on this? Um, and, and, and do you think enforcement 
uh, will be required relating to that. Now, that gentleman was so quick, I, I couldn't but miss his hand. Sorry, if you, say, if you could stand up and, and say who you are, or stay seated, say who you are and who you represent. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I'm David Hunter. I'm one of two representatives here from the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, Max, which advises uh, Scottish ministers on disability and access uh, transport issues. Um, just wanted to say uh, that um, it's the one part of the bill that Max has formally requested to be changed. Um, as many of you know, and some of you have been involved in uh, disability organisations and walking organisations have campaigned for years to have a excuse me, a ban for pavement parking, for reasons that I probably don't need to um, reiterate. Um, to allow waste bin lorries and, park and uh, loading to uh, park on pavements seems to drive a coach and horses through the principle um, that pavement parking is wrong. And what we'd really like this legislation to do is to send a signal that pavement parking is antisocial and in practice, what I'd particularly like you to consider is a parking attendant coming across a, a vehicle which is parked on the pavement. Instead of just saying, OK, there's a vehicle that needs to be ticketed, they think, could this vehicle be parking? Uh, could, could it be loading? Um, has it got its hazard lights on? Um, shall I come back in an hour um, and see if it's still there? What it will actually mean is it will actually legitimise, um, as, as you, your note said, uh, short-term pavement parking. And uh, we think this would be... a uh, to say it's a, a missed opportunity um, would be an understatement. So we hope that that's removed from the, the bill. Jo John, you wanted to just yes, question that. The Road Haulage Association in this morning, and they said our roads are so badly designed there's absolutely nowhere for a lorry to park um, if it's delivering to a pub or a shop or anything in the high streets. So how, how would you answer them? Well, um, lorries uh, are probably... Uh, along with bin lorries, probably the, the, the last things you want to park on pavements because they trash the pavement apart from anything else and uh, make it a hazard for pedestrians, particularly disabled pedestrians. Um, I, I've heard it said that uh, this would mean that people have to load three streets away. I, I actually think that's, that's just a, a total exaggeration. And normally there are places where you can park to, to load. Um, there could be a distinction between the double parking and the pavement parking um, aspects of, of the bill, which, which are all treated together, and I'm particularly talking about pavement parking. Um, so, you know, we, we don't think that, uh, that pavement parking should be permitted at all for loading purposes. Um, the other thing I'd just say is that, this, that the bill doesn't talk about delivery vehicles. It talks about for the purpose of loading and unloading. So I think this would be used for people shopping, people delivering their shopping. Um, if people got tickets, I think they would appeal them and say that they were loading. And I think that they'd win a lot. And I think all of this hugely incentivises pavement parking rather than banning it, which is what we'd like to see the bill do. De Debbie, there's a gentleman over there that, that would like to come in. Sorry, the gentleman at the back, and then I'll come to the... To, to the guy in blue. Um, am, I on? am I on? Yep, thanks, convener. Um, I'm Walter Scott. Uh, I work for Angus Council. Uh, I'm also a member of the Society for Chief Officers for Transportation Scotland. Um, the views that I'll represent, I think, I think are representative of that organisation, and particularly in terms of the, the, the comments attributed to the Road Haulage Association. Um, they are quite correct. Our streets are not designed for HGVs. Um, many of our streets are not actually designed. Um, they have just built up over, over history and generations. What I would suggest in that regard, rather than thinking it's a purely an infrastructure issue, that we need to be designing our services, we need to be designing our means of delivery around the infrastructure that we have available. Um, otherwise, the actual cost of making our uh, roads and streets fully accessible for such deliveries would be um, disproportionate. So I think it's a case of designing our services, including our delivery services, around whatever is in the bill. Thanks, Walter. The, the, the gentleman there. Um, so sorry, sorry, could you introduce uh, sorry. yourself and, and say if you represent an organisation? Um, it's Dave Dufer from Spokes, the Loathing Cycle Campaign. Um, to further follow up on John Mason's question, um, with regard to large lorries delivering, of course, one of the options is that you have 
um, what they call trans uh, transmission stations near the centre of the of the city, where big lorries can deposit their stuff, and then it gets transferred into e cargo bikes or small electric vehicles and so on, which greatly reduces the difficulties of delivering to local shops. Um, and the second point on this is um, David, in his speech, mentioned about double parking. And of course, double parking is covered in the bill as well. Although we talk about pavement parking, we forget that the bill covers double parking as well. And it's essential in our organisation's view that that is retained. And if, as we hope, the 20 minute exemption for pavement parking is removed, then the same should happen with double parking because double parking is very hazardous for both pedestrians and cyclists. If you're trying to cross the road as a pedestrian, obviously it's far more difficult, push chair or whatever if you're double parking. And similarly with the cyclists, you have to go out right into the stream of traffic and there's the danger of the double parked vehicle opening its door. Okay, I think John, you wanted to <coughs> ask a, a question. Uh, then, uh, Thank you, Convener. So I follow on to the, the gentleman from Spokes there. I think the figure we heard this morning, I don't know if the gentleman's here tonight, from the Road Haulage Association was that one heavy goods vehicle would require 28 vans mm -hmm. to deliver its cargo. So it is about the unintended consequences sometimes with a distribution service and small vehicles. Okay. Uh, does yeah. anyone want to... The, sorry, uh, you, the gentleman there, in the, is it a grey shirt? Grey, yes. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, and and much of the transport the bill covers great areas, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I'm Derek Young from the Community Transport Association. And uh, we've, we've talked a good bit about goods vehicles, but there is also a class of passenger carrying vehicles who don't have access to bus stops. Uh, and that's uh, community transport uh, vehicles if they're not running a community bus service under a Section 22 permit. Um, very often they are demand responsive and they provide a door to vehicle service. That's very often a condition of the contract they may have or the grant funding they have. And that will require very short term parking in a place which there might be no ability for a larger vehicle such as a minibus, not as good big as a heavy goods vehicle, to be able to provide that support for individuals who are vulnerable, uh, who might be older, who have mobility challenges to their door and sometimes into their house as well. So we, we actually an organisation have, um, don't think that should justify pavement parking, but we think there might be instances where there are double parking where that should be treated in a regulatory fashion, which makes sense, notwithstanding the point that Spokes has made. Okay. Does, does anyone else want to come? Sandy Taylor. Oh, sorry, yes, the gentleman there. Sandy Taylor. Uh, Andrew Taylor. Hello, my name is Sandy Taylor. I represent Sandy. the National Federation of the Blind, the UK, and you'll notice I couldn't make eye contact with you, convener. Um, the situation of pavement parking has been ex exacerbated by the introduction recently of shared space, where pavement curbs have been removed or reduced in height, and this has made it very, very easy for, for cars and vans to bump up on the pavement and park. And as someone else said earlier, these pavements were never designed for heavy goods vehicles and they will break up the pavements very, very easily. So for visually impaired and other disabled people, pavement parking is a real hazard and we would ask you to ban it totally. Thank you. Do, does anyone else want to come back on pavement parking? What about, uh, there's, a, there's a lady at the back there. Hi, I'm Sally Hinchcliffe from Pedal on Parliament. Um, I peddled on Parliament today. Um, uh, just, uh, I'll just pick up on something Ian Doherty said about, um, you mentioned footway parking, and a point that's been raised is that um, we, we're now starting to see separated cycle tracks as well as footways, and does the law, we need to make sure the legislation covers parking on those because the new wide segregated cycle tracks that are being built, where they're being built to quality, have become very tempting targets for parking and we need to make sure that we don't move parking off the pavement and onto the cycle paths and then lose all the benefits of segregated cycle cycleways okay i mean uh, people have mentioned about uh, uh, about what should be and what shouldn't be allowed does that rely on 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 lots of enforcement officers uh, i mean is that going to be an issue does somebody want to uh, tom do you, do you want to come on that yeah well <clears throat> the evidence that the evidence that is out there demonstrates that if you move from a police enforcement regime to a decriminalised enforcement regime, the level of enforcement goes up, and I would suggest, goes up very significantly. And I would therefore suggest that if there's any hope 
of enforcing these double parking and footway parking regulations, then decriminalised enforcement uh, of some form will be required all over Scotland, which we do not have at the present time. Um, on the, the loading issue, there's an absence of evidence from the London case to demonstrate whether the permit permission of loading on the footway does actually cause significant problems at the current time in that regime. Um, in, the, in the legislation in London, loading, loading is permitted on the footway, but we don't know what problems that's causing. What is not in the legislation is the 20 minute uh, rule, and uh, it would seem there's a lot of support for getting rid of that um, around the table. Okay, Jamie, do you want to? Thank you, convener. Um, okay, a few comments. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the one you've just made first that on enforcement. Uh, you know, given that we already have substantial amount of regulation around parking in general, um, which is not being enforced, there is a genuine question as to by adding further regulation, how enforced that regulation will be and whose job it will be and the cost of doing so, especially the local authorities where <clears throat> there is no decriminalised parking at present and it's a, it could say a bit of a free-for-all in many places. So whilst we may have a national approach to it, a local on the ground level in the communities that you live in, um, how much of this will actually be enforced? And that's a serious question to be asked of the bill team. But going back to the issue of pavement parking, double parking, I think one of the problems that's coming out uh, from the discussion this evening and previous discussions is the fact we're, that it's been lumped together. And they are actually quite two separate issues in, in some ways. So the restriction of, of, uh, of access to pavements due to vehicles is a, is a separate issue in terms of accessibility of the pavement users. But the, for example, the 20 minute exemption, uh, I think probably was geared around the double parking or side by side parking, in the sense that vehicles turning up outside your door, uh, they want to deliver your, your shopping that night or your Amazon delivery, they need to stop outside your door to get the goods in and out. They're very unlikely to park on the pavement in the majority of instances, they're more likely to double park alongside existing parked cars. And I think that's perhaps where there's been a, 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 an acceptance that how do we accommodate that without setting up an environment where people take advantage of it. And there will be a continuous 20 minute temporary parking by a number of successive vehicles that then means you just have an, an eternal stream of double parking. And I think the government has had a difficult job on this, to be fair to them. So I wonder if, if this, the current approach of the bill to lump pavement parking and double parking together maybe could be separated to look at the two, uh, uh, that you could, for example, have a blanket ban with no exemption on pavement parking, but there may be some mechanism to allow temporary double parking for the unloading of goods and what type of vehicles is another discussion. So I do wonder if, if the bill isn't really meeting those needs. Okay, I'd like to bring in the, the, the gentleman at the back, uh, there in the middle. Oh. Terry Hegarty, in this capacity, Ross of Mulland, I own a community transport scheme. And I'm guilty of pavement parking to help an old lady out of her vehicle without blocking the carriageway to buses and other traffic so that I can get her into the house on her Zimmer frame. And I'm guilty of double parking because in Benesson on the Isle of Mull, all havoc breaks loose between half past 11 and half past 12 when the post arrives. And if that coincides with a spa lorry being there as well, and I've got to get a blind lady into the bus or a frail lady out of the bus, then I'm guilty on both counts. If the motivation for the legislation is to say, well, we're actually in favour of taking care of those people and that's what it's all about, then bear my dilemma in mind on the Isle of Mull rather than making me a criminal for sticking up for the people that we most want to look after. Okay, and, and, and I, I'm going to bring the gentleman in there. And I mean, certainly we, we've heard this on the committee before. Sorry, the gentleman at the table, it's fine. That we've heard this before, that, that some pavements are designed for, for, for parking in some areas. I think, uh, uh, John, you, there's some places in your area where, where actually it's encouraged. Oh, sorry, the gentleman there, yeah. 
Jim Savage from Aberdeenshire Council. Just picking up on the point that's been made, really, in terms of the viability of enforcement, uh, two, two matters, really. Firstly, the huge diversity, as uh, members will know, in terms of the, uh, the mix between rural and urban areas and how to find the right balance in terms of what the provision will be. Uh, and linked to that, again, is, I think, that practical reality in terms of the capacity needed to be able to enforce effectively and the viability of getting uh, the right number of people in whichever organisation it is to make it commercially and financially viable. Uh, certainly from a rural uh, authority, uh, particularly hard. We have a real mixture of different areas which need different uh, provision of enforcement, uh, and that can be quite difficult to, to make work and be viable and all. Authorities, in very practical terms, uh, don't currently have the financing and the funding to be able to subsidise this matter, so it needs to be a fair amount of work and probably flexibility to be given to see what the balance is struck in terms of how to make it viable, how to fund this, how to finance this, and to meet the needs that the bill is seeking to achieve, and to account for that diversity of different communities. Okay. Uh, yeah, on that particular point, John, if you'd like. So, so is there enough money in the bill to finance your council and other councils to carry out these responsibilities? I think I'd raise a question about that to say we think more work needs to be done to be able to answer that question. We think that some of the work is probably um, uh, needs a bit more uh, diligence to be able to actually answer that one. Okay, okay uh, just for, uh, because I know uh, Gail Ross, who's the Deputy Commander of the Committee, has got a particular uh, issue that she'd like to raise. But can I just say, it, it really is your discussion, so if, if you want to be included, just raise your hand and, uh, and I'll acknowledge it as I see it and I'll bring you in because I'm very keen to hear as many uh, views as possible. But Gail, you had a particular point. You I did, to... convener. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. One of the things that is missing from the bill and uh, several of my constituents have contacted me about it is it's more inconsiderate parking, but it's the uh, issue of parking on dropped curbs. And I wondered if anybody had uh, any views on that. Okay, there's a gentleman there. Um, yes, you. Yep. Um, okay, Keith Irving from Cycling Scotland. I've been involved with this legislation going back to 2008 when Ross Finney proposed it. Um, my understanding as an external stakeholder is that dropped curb parking will be included in associated secondary legislation um, so that there will be a restriction on dropped curb parking and we would fully support that. It's absolutely okay. essential. I can bring Tom in, and then there's a lady at the back. I, sorry, I've forgotten your name, but I'll bring you back in again. Sorry, Tom. Clear, as you may be aware, the uh, ban on drop curb parking was introduced uh, in England and Wales through the 2004 Traffic Management Act in England, and has been operating since about 2007 uh, successfully. Uh, whether or not there's any kind of parking restriction at that curb. Okay, sorry, yes. Sorry, Sally again from Pedal on Parliament. Just, just to say, as, as well as drop curbs, is also, uh, again, as we start to build better cycling infrastructure, it's access in and out of cycling, into cycling infrastructure, which may not be drop curbs. So, for instance, where you've got a, a modal filter and a bollard, uh, which allows bikes to pass through but not cars, if there's a car parked right across it, um, that's, that's equally as a, an issue, um, especially if you're in a bike where you can't easily get on and off, uh, like a cargo bike or an adaptive cycle. It, it does seem odd that if we've gone to the thing of, of having drop curves that we, we, we obstruct them. Now, but some people, when they came, when they were raising this, there was some talk about income for, or, or from surplus fines for off-street parking uh, uh, and road improvement projects it should be used to improve cycling and walking. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that? Uh, you can't come in again. There must be somebody else. I'll let, let somebody else come in. Sorry, uh, yes, Kate, do you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, I don't think fines should be used as a substitute for proper funding. Okay, no, fines not for... Uh, uh, Tom? Um, the research that's been done on congestion charging suggests... Not that I wanted to suggest that should be in the bill. Uh, we've already got legislation for that. But the research that's been done on congestion charging suggests that it becomes more acceptable and parking charging becomes more acceptable when people know that the money raised is being used to fund alternatives and improvements. OK, now, now you can come in, if, if you like, a, again. I only just wanted to say, yeah, that, that was our point, that it, it should be part of driving a modal shift rather than simply providing more parking, which will just obviously create, generate more demand. Um, yeah. OK. Does, that, does anyone have any other...? Yes. Kelvin Dale, Community Council. Over the past 10 years, there's been a great big awareness in the general public about subjects such as biodiversity and recycling. 
So on this particular subject of pavement parking, as well as legislation, don't forget we can also have education as well. Educate the public. They're not as irresponsible and thick as maybe we think they are. Maybe if you just tell them that it's inconsiderate, it's not to be done, they might take the hint. That's my point. Okay. So in, encouragement as, as well. There was another suggestion, and, and I'm keen to hear any views on this, is that uh, a bill might be amended to allow for private non-residential parking levies, which could be applied to workplaces and other car-intensive destinations. So anyone have a view? Yes. That was actually my question. See, we did read them all. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I was, I was delighted that that got slipped in, because it does refer to an amendment. But since Ian and Tom have both raised it, I feel justified also. Um, <clears throat> it relates to buses as well. Um, Ian began, his very first sentence was that um, if we really, the, 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 the best thing this bill could do would be to um, stop the decline in bus usage. And Tom then pointed out that although the measures in the bill, such as integrated ticketing and regulation, etc., <clears throat> will be beneficial, the number one problem is demand management and congestion on buses um, and similarly the increasing disparity between the cost of using a bus and the cost of motoring. <clears throat> so um, I also found in local transport today an article saying that the Scottish Government is themselves considering amending the bill to allow workplace parking levy. I don't know where that came from, but it's in the local transport today <clears throat> magazine. Um, and what Spokes would like to put forward is that if the bill is amended in such a way, it should not just be a workplace parking levy, <clears throat> but a wider private non-residential parking levy. So in other words, <clears throat> local authorities would have powers. It's not compulsory, but local authorities would have powers to charge premises for the number of car spaces. And they could choose to do it at workplaces. They could choose to do it at um, leisure centres or supermarkets. It would be entirely flexible. <clears throat> we had a talk at Transform Scotland by one of the instigators of the Nottingham parking levy, which Tom was, Tom was present at this meeting, and she said <clears throat> the English legislation only gives them powers for a workplace levy, but her ideal would be there were powers to local authorities for all types of parking levy. And so um, possibly Tom would like to comment further, but this is very much what we would like to see in, in the bill. Tom and then Ian. Yeah, forgive me if I already said this. Um, I'm having a bit of a senior moment, but the uh, research and evaluation that's been done by colleagues at Loughborough University of the Nottingham Workplace Parking Levy demonstrates that it has had a beneficial visual impact on congestion whilst the economy of Nottingham has continued to grow. Sorry, just say that again. Just so I didn't quite catch that. It has had a beneficial. It has, yeah, it has had a beneficial impact. They, they've controlled for other factors and demonstrated that the workplace parking levy itself, which by the way only applies to employers with ten or more employer parking spaces, employee parking spaces, has had a beneficial impact on congestion okay, this in is the city. This has provoked quite a lot of arms being raised. Just, just raising, ra raising the thing. Perhaps when, when you're considering this is the, the, those areas where they don't have bus services and correct levels of public transport, they probably have to rely on cars to get to some of these places because there's no alternative. Ian, and then I'm going to come to you and then to the gentleman at the back. So. I, I just wanted to express furious agreement with Dave's important point that such a levy should be about non-residential parking and not limited to workplace parking. An example of that at the moment is that there's a, a secondary kind of wave of out-of-town retailing competition which is appearing it's because as consumer habits become more sophisticated and the trip to the shopping mall becomes one of a little bit of shopping and more of a leisure activity and if you've been to these places recently you'll see how there's an explosion of kind of kids entertainment and cinema development and all the rest of it there's a, a renewed threat on town and city centres from a new wave of out-of-town development and that's exactly the kind of uh, issue that would not be captured if it were a workplace parking levy rather than a non-residential one. Sorry, yes. Hi everyone, is this on? Yeah, it's on, um, don't worry, he's um, watching you very closely, it's just on your right. <laughs> I'm Ellie Harrison, I'm from the Get Glasgow Moving campaign and we're a volunteer-run campaign 
for a world-class, fully integrated and accessible publicly owned public transport network for everyone in our city. Um, and I'm hoping to come back in and speak a bit more when we get onto the bus sections of, of the bill. Um, but really, I guess our issue with the bill um, in general is the fact that it doesn't seem to take a sort of holistic overview of the whole transport infrastructure. Um, and I guess we support a workplace parking levy, we support um, a low emission zone and a potential congestion charge, anything that is going to reduce congestion um, in Glasgow city centre and potentially raise revenue that can be reinvested in improving and expanding the public transport network. So we, what we want to see is a joined up governance structure for the city, which is going to ensure that something like the low emission zone, a potential congestion charge and a potential workplace parking levy, that money is going to be reinvested in expanding and improving the public transport network. I've lived in Glasgow 10 years. Before that, I actually lived in Nottingham uh, for eight years. And in that time, I saw them build an entire tram network and then bring in the workplace parking levy once it was up and running. So they had that world-class public transport network starting to be built so people could see it and they could see, well, actually, I don't need to drive to work because the alternative is there. You just got back on track on time when you mentioned trams and parking. Otherwise, I, I might have had to pull you up. But the gentleman there, and we're coming on to buses next, okay, so you'll uh, get a chance there. Walter Scott, Angus Council and, and Scott. Um, yeah, you've kind of picked up my point there in terms of of any workplace levy, you do have to have the provision there for alternative means of, of transport and therefore to jump ahead and think that's necessarily going to be uh, able to address the other is going to be hugely challenging. And then just a, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a plaintiff plea from a, from a humble council officer, uh, it's just clarity in terms of, of what you're asking local authorities to do, whether you're asking them to do it, in which case it's a power or whether you are requiring them to do it and it is a duty or responsibility. We need to be very careful there in terms of how we are giving powers to local authorities when we may be very different. Okay, that's a very good point. Jamie, you wanted a quick question. Yeah, I think that, that's a really interesting point and that's, what, what is the bill doing? Is it enabling local authorities to do what's right for their area? Is it empowering them to do it? Is it forcing them to do it? Is it asking them nicely to do it? And are we going to see different schemes in different parts of Scotland? The point that's been raised a few times is what do you do with all that money that's raised? Does it get sucked into a big black hole of local authority funding or will it be ring-fenced and will it be put to good use uh, to benefit pedestrian cycling, improve, to build trams? I'm not saying the sort of revenues would be of that scale, perhaps, to do that. But you make a really valid point is that if people would be more inclined to pay the fine, the levy, the charge, whatever it is, if they saw some tangible benefits, if they knew there were improved bus services in and out of town, if there was a tram system, if they could see some benefit to local infrastructure, if traffic was moving more quickly and more freely, if, there, if commuting became more easy uh, or cheaper. Um, but if it's just seen as a tax and a charge and there's no benefit, you won't get that society buy-in that you need to get the behavioural change that we need to make this work. I'm going to do three more comments on parking, and then we're going to move on to a, a very knotty subject. So, the gentleman... It's Keith, is it, is it Keith? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, agreeing with the, the parking levy comments, especially by Ian, the one other issue, parking issue that's not in the current bill is enforcement of zigzags at pedestrian crossings and outside schools. It is legally difficult, but I would encourage the committee to... Um, at least encourage that to be reviewed because if we're creating a clear, consistent uh, law on parking, people would find it daft that you can park outside a school on a, on a keep clear sign and actually that cannot be enforced but by a decriminalised officer. It can't be enforced. So zigzag lines c can't... Yellow zigzag lines outside schools unless there is an associated order with them. Uh, Fife Council has an order. So Fife Council, you could be enforced, but most other local authority areas... Well, I, I'm, I, do you know, I've learned something, which is one of the great things about this, this meeting, is I thought that if you were on, on a zigzag line of any description, you, you, you were 
socially unacceptable and, li and liable to a huge fine. So the gentleman next to you, and then I'm going to come to Tom, and then we're going to move on to the next one. So Jim Savage, Aberdeenshire Council, just picking up on the point in terms of funding <laughs> and the point in terms of duty and power, we certainly uh, wish it to be a power rather than a duty, and think that the funding, I think, as the colleague has said, needs to be a, a wholly separate matter uh, away from the base funding for authorities. Very important for communities to see that there's a reinvestment back into infrastructure for a number of different modes of transport and not funding that's going to be used to provide a completely different service or activity from a local authority point of view. Tom, do you want to come in briefly? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, responding to the point about the tram in Nottingham, the research that I mentioned from Loughborough University um, controlled for the effects of the tram. So the congestion reduction impacts of the workplace parking levy in Nottingham are in addition to any effects that might have been brought about by the tram. Uh, secondly, just picking up on Jamie's point there, um, of course Scotland already has transport legislation which uh, would allow the hypothecation, which is what you were talking about, of revenue from a demand management technique. The 2001 Transport Scotland Act, the powers regarding congestion charging, already say that that money raised should be hypothecated to transport related um, things. So there's a precedent for it already in law here. OK, we're going to go on with buses, I'm afraid, now. We're, we're, we're quite limited on time. I'm sure we could talk about parking all evening, but uh, parking is now part bus service. Uh, the bill will allow local transport authorities to provide bus service where there's unmet demand and no private sector position, uh, provision. It also replaces bus quality partnerships with bus service improvement partnerships. Uh, and it replaces bus quality contracts with local service franchises and requires bus industry stakeholders to make open data available to information providers. It's quite an interesting part of the bill and, it, and it's caused the committee a certain amount of um, questioning about how all the buses and the different bus companies and, and things are run in Scotland. Um, do you, the question, I guess, that has got to start this off is, um, do you think the bill gives local authorities uh, enough of a range of options to help them deliver a better bus service in their areas and respond to local needs? Now, you said you were coming in on buses, and in you come. <laughs> Hi again. Um, yeah, so we, on the 3rd of October, we handed in our petition with 10,184 signatures collected from across Glasgow calling for publicly owned buses and calling for a fully integrated and accessible public transport network. We don't think that, well, we know the bill in its current state isn't going to <laughs> deliver um, a public bus company for Glasgow um, that matches up to what you have here in Edinburgh with Lothian buses. Um, we want the bill to be amended so that publicly owned companies can run both commercial and non-commercial routes. So again, they can cross-subsidise, use profits from profitable routes in Glasgow, um, which are currently all being run by first buses, use that profit to subsidise le less profitable routes, um, and in terms of franchising, we do see that franchising could deliver huge benefits to Glasgow if it was properly implemented. But we're worried with having these two different options, having the bus service improvement partnerships and the franchising option, that local authorities will... Um, basically, they need to be enforced, uh, forced, as you said, suggested, Jamie, to implement the franchising frameworks um, and to make it work for passengers rather than for the profit-making bus companies. OK, there's a couple of interesting points. So the gentleman here, would you, yes, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Brian Gordon. I'm uh, representing the Tayside and Central Transport Partnership. And uh, to boot, I was a bus driver for 25 years. Uh, and I've seen the excess of bus deregulation, and I've seen how the companies over the years have cherry-picked the routes and left the, uh, the unfavourable uh, routes to uh, community transports and, uh, and things like that. Well, we're going to have to get back to some, something like the money going back in to what it's meant to be for, and that's to pay for 
uh, unfashionable areas where elderly people are not now uh, stay and they can't get uh, um, they, they can't get a, a bus I've got near their door. If, as a councillor, I speak a lot to the transport company in Dundee every time they withdraw from an area and uh, we've got to have petitions and meetings and that to try and get them to come back. The council come come back and pick up the slack by subsidising the route. But it takes a lot of effort from the community to get that. So this is not working at all. When you speak to the companies, what you've got since bus deregulation is we're a commercial company. <laughs> we know you're a commercial company, but you've got to put something back in to what you're taking out. So we're going to have to look at that and maybe go further with what we're saying in the bill to make sure that these communities across Scotland get the transport service that they deserve, the okay. transport service that they paid for. OK, now th there are a few hands going up, so I'd t take you next, if I may. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. OK, uh, Robert Andrew, Managing Director for Scotland for Stagecoach. Um, it was very quiet during the parking discussion. I actually thoroughly enjoyed that, and you know, thinking the unintended consequences of legislation and whether it means buses might not be able to serve some roads and you know, just the, the bottlenecks and congestion that are caused by white van man are just passing comments for, for committee members. Uh, the, the bus element is obviously one that's very close to my heart. Um, I am old enough to remember the pre-deregulation era gist. Uh, I could bore committee members with what that meant in practice, as opposed to memories which at times might be rose-tinted you know, about how things were. Um, but in ter terms of what's being proposed, uh, you know, I think Jonathan Cowie you know, gave a very accurate account of bus industry finances as stand today. And the, the perception and the wrong perception that there are excess profits in the industry, and that therefore there's this element of funding that could then be used to cross subsidise whatever. And I think that was very, very eloquently put. There's that other body of evidence out there, and you know, Chris Chica could point the committee to, you know, sort of can demonstrate the fact that the, the whole ownership and regulatory model doesn't actually change the finances one jot. You know, at the end of the day, where it's about moving people, it's about the cost of the industry, which are largely fixed. And it's how then that transpires through to, to provide the quality of service that the, the travelling public in Scotland actually want and need. In terms of partnership, the biggest barrier to partnership under the old model has actually been local authority funding cycles and the difficulty that officers have had being able to commit to issues taking place over more than a one year term. You know, there have been a small number of statutory quality partnerships in Scotland, generally in the Strathclyde area. You know, there was one nearly came in in the Inverness area, but again, it was the inability of the local authority to commit to measures over a sustained period that meant that that never saw the light of day. So the subtle changes that are being made to actually talk about measures rather than infrastructure, you know, whilst in some ways that's diluting the potential impact of partnerships, should actually break down a lot of the barriers in local authority thinking to bring these things in. You know, franchising, I can't say any more than, than Jonathan Cowie said in terms of, you know, it, just won't work. You know, we've been here before. The decline is even worse in those days. The challenge to the bus industry is not the bus industry. The challenge to the bus industry is the growing congestion. It's how we deal with the fact that people's habits have changed, the way they live, the way they work, the way they shop has all changed over time. We've had a discussion about workplace parking levy and you know parking charges at retail parks. They didn't exist 30 years ago, generally, and certainly not in the scale they are today. So we actually need to get to the root cause and not have the debate about who owns it and who regulates it. That's not the real issue. OK. There's a whole heap of things coming up, uh, people coming up with, with questions. I mean, we heard from Transport uh, for London, and, and, and they were saying that buses, if you've, if you've got them regular and people can see them coming and they can plan their trip and, and they know it's going to be on time, that, that helps and, and lifts bus transport and the amount of people that are prepared to use them. Tom, do you, uh, do you want to come in? And there's... I think you you were yeah. looking at, and there's a gentleman at the back, and there's a lady there, and, and I'm really going to forget everyone in a minute, but Tom, go, go for it. Um, I, I mean, it may be a slight surprise, but I would like to concur with some of what Robert has said. Um, I, I don't think we should see franchising on its own as any kind of panacea to the difficulties that the bus industry faces. And uh, sometimes when we think about what bus services could be like, we, of course, look to some other countries in, in Europe. And I've, I've, I've got some data um, which sort of looks at 
couple of or three countries where they have franchising and where they basically put more money in more public money into the bus network. So in Scotland in 2015-16, uh, the funding per head, the public funding per head uh, for the bus industry was £57. Pounds. Um, if we look at all of Norway, it was about, it wasn't as much as you might expect, it's about £79, £80. Pounds. Uh, if we look at the Copenhagen metropolitan area, it was uh, £85. Pounds. If we get to Stockholm region, it was £109 pounds per head. So when we get to Stockholm, we're getting you know, up to twice as much per head of public money into the bus industry um, than, than we have in this country. And so franchising without extra public money is unlikely to achieve as much as people might hope it would. I, I'm, I'm going to try and bring in some people who haven't had a chance to come in. So there's a gentleman there, and then there's a gentleman there, and, and a lady there. So, so yes. Andrew Jarvis, I'm the Managing Director for FIRST in Glasgow. Um, the average speed of our buses now in Glasgow is just over nine miles an hour, 9.06 miles an hour. It, it's got nothing to do with who regulates the buses. It's got everything to do with congestion and the changes in people's lives that have happened over the last 20 years. And they, they haven't, I suppose those changes haven't, um, uh, the pace of change has quickened, but you can see that the decline in bus patronage happens, started in the 50s. And apart from a few years where it's gone the, the, the right way, it's continuing. So uh, whether it's regulated or unregulated, though, unless we actually change the fundamentals of what we're doing, we're, we're, we're effectively rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. We're doing nothing about the fact there's a dirty great hole. So for me, it's a, it's a very sterile debate about regulation, franchising. It's not going to make the blindest bit of difference. To say that we don't cross subsidise is also completely wrong. So for example, if we have e quieter evening journeys or quieter journeys on services, on a Sunday, we still operate those as part of the overall network. We don't give those up for, for somebody else to fund. OK, thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman at the back there who's now got the microphone. Yeah. Ian Findlay from Paths for All. We're the national charity that promotes physical activity through everyday walking and active travel. I'd just like to um, support very much Ian Doherty's opening remark about this, the most important thing being increasing in bus pass trinage. And I'd like to emphasise the link between bus travel and active travel. Because if you think of bus travel, every journey starts and finishes with usually a walk, if not a cycle. So I think we need to look at the whole journey and not just the bus element of the journey, although the bus element is very, very important. If we're going to change people's behaviour, and the main behaviour change we're looking for here is to move people out of the private motor car and onto public transport. I do fear if we just think of the bus element of this journey, then we'll not bring about the behaviour change that we're looking for, which is increase in bus patronage. OK, thank you. And the, yes. Sheila Fletcher from the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. My question really that I put to the committee was about rural transport and about the problem that we have in rural areas with the proportion of coaches we have on local bus services. Now, I don't think really, unless the local authority and, and the bus companies agreed that they wanted to introduce fully accessible buses, then I don't think that this is going to be solved. But it is a major issue, and it means that in rural areas, and as some of you know, I have a community transport background, We, the groups that I used to work with we're expected to fill that gap, and I don't think we, they should be expected to fill that gap. I think we should have bus services, including coaches, that are fully accessible and that everybody is able to use. And I'm not too sure whether the bill as it currently stands will enable that. And it's really a big issue in rural, rural okay. Highland. Maureen, did you want to ask, ask a question? Because there's a gentleman behind you, but, but if you'd like to ask a question, start with... Okay, it was just um, a few comments. I mean, I think m most of the committee members are very aware that, you know, this is not a transport bill in isolation. It's got to be looked at in terms of, of climate change and, and active travel and everything else. And I do think, you know, franchising of buses is perhaps a, a bit of a dead end kind of discussion. Uh, it is about getting more people uh, onto public transport. And we heard, for example, this morning that um, the young um, are more likely to uh, 
book a taxi for a short journey. They don't own cars to the same extent that older generations have done. Um, but rather than go on a bus, they will book um, a taxi, either a, ta um, a taxi or more uh, likely to be um, Uber with, with the young because they'll have um, an Uber account. And I think that was really um, quite sobering. I mean, I think I agree that not just in urban areas, but in rural areas, congestion for the buses and more, more bus lanes um, are needed. But, you know, there it is absolutely a culture change. We had a, um, an event in, on the new AWPR a few weekends ago called Go North East, and nobody was allowed to drive on the new AWPR, but we had to go to a park and ride and get on a bus. And we were queuing for the buses, and the number of people in front of me and behind me, you know, who were there for a Sunday outing with, you know, their, their larger extended families were saying, oh, I can't mind the last time I was on a bus. And the other one's saying, I don't think I've ever been on a bus. So it's this kind of culture which doesn't exist to the same extent in Edinburgh and the Lothians, because even the old ladies of Morningside will get on a bus. But, you know, the, it, it is something that we really have to change in Scotland. The gentleman, uh, sorry, have you, have you got the mic, Ben? Yeah, uh, Chris McGee, Eastern Bartonshire Council. Uh, my point kind of goes back to what is the, the aim of this part of the bill with buses. And it has to arrest the fall in patronage that's happened the last few years. Um, and buses are a major part of our public transport network. 75% of journeys are made by bus, so it's not a, a small issue. It's something that's very important. So if the, ma the main aim of the bill is to reduce um, the fall, and by doing that, by giving local authorities more powers, then I think it's important that we give local, local transport authorities powers that are feasible to use. And right now within the bill, um, by restricting them to services that will probably be loss-making services, they're restricting local transport authorities um, their powers. And I take the commercial operator's point about it doesn't matter who operates the service, it's about congestion. And I, I, I agree, it's, we need to look at that through local transport strategies yeah. and bus service improvement partnerships, with it, which are in the bill as well. But if the overall aim is to give local transport authorities more powers, we need to make sure that they're viable and that this part of the bill is workable. OK, thank you. I'm going to try and bring in a couple of experts and the, then I'm going to come to you. So, Kate, you, did you want to say something? Um, and then I'm going to bring Ian in straight after. OK, yeah, just um, three quick points in response to various people, I think, that may be helpful. Um, the gentleman from Paths for All uh, wanted to stress, uh, stress the link between active travel and public transport use, and I'd like to, to point out that there is, in fact, evidence that um, from obesity studies that people that use public transport are, on average, not as heavy as people who are dependent on their cars, um, and that is precisely because there is an active travel element for most bus use. Um, and uh, I'd like to pick up on Sheila Fletcher's point about um, the, the problems for rural areas. It's not exactly her point, but I think um, rural areas in general are not really served very well by this bill. Um, and they really need some commercial demand responsive services that can bridge the gap between fixed route buses and expensive taxis. Um, because, uh, I mean, in the northeast of Scotland where I live, we've got huge buses on our route, but we only get them once an hour. Um, and uh, they're very uncomfortable. Um, and we'd need something that bridges the gap and that maybe goes a little more often. Um, and um, Maureen's point about the Uberization of the young, I think that's a point that's very, very important. They don't know how to use buses, so they bypass them entirely because the apps make it so easy. And there's a lot of evidence in the United States that where Uber get a foothold in the market, transit use goes down dramatically. And, and I think that, that was echoed in the Transport for London's thing, that you can actually see where your bus is, where it is on the route. <laughs> And that makes it easier and more beneficial to travel in. And then I'm going to come to you. Thank you. Um, I, I am not philosophically opposed to the public ownership of services and assets. But I think I'd agree with my academic co colleagues in that it's really hard to find the evidence to say that more regulation is going to solve the problems that we're facing. I think that's important to say. However, however... Um, to counter that a little bit, the bus industry does receive about a third, in some operators' cases, about a half of its revenue from the public purse. 
So you might expect our expectations of bus companies to be slightly different than other commercial companies on that basis. Uh, and I'm sitting far enough away from my colleagues in the bus industry, one of whom is looking directly at me right now, mm -hmm. to say we do also have to recognise that as well as congestion being a big problem, as well as a change in lifestyles, etc., that we all know about and there is research to demonstrate, the product is too often poor. Now, on the railways, we have the Squire Quality Incentive Regime where there is a quality regulatory framework designed to make the experience of travelling by train as good as it can be. And believe me, if you travel around in the north of England on its regional railway network, you will see the difference that that makes to the passenger experience in comparison with the railway in Scotland. So I do wonder if there is a legitimate role for some kind of quality regime and expectations, given the amount of public money that goes into the bus industry. However, and to try and guarantee I get out of the room alive, um, I don't know the up-to-date figures for Scotland, but I do for the UK because I was reading them for something I was writing the other day. And in round terms, we spend something like 12 times as much money on the railways as we do on the buses. The railways account for only 2% of all trips in the UK. Um, and one of my, in fact, my favourite ever quote from any academic interview I've ever done um, from a former senior local authority officer in Scotland was that there are two definitions of policy. Policy is either what you put in your documents or it's what you spend your money on. So if we're serious about social inclusion, if we're serious about the economy, if we're serious about inclusive growth, we do have to think about what we spend public money on. So, so that's Maybe we should be exploring more whether the money should be collected by the local authority or regional authorities and distributed back out to the bus companies. Um, like they do in, in London. I, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, Maureen, you jumped in there, and I'm not going <laughs> to let you get away with it, because I, it will set a precedent which is completely <laughs> unacceptable. There's a gentleman just having a drink out of his glass of water, has been queuing up, and then I want to bring Jonathan, Jonathan in. And, and I've got Colin, and I've got John, and I've got a gentleman at the back, and, and I've got you again. So, so, sorry, if you'd like to go first. Yes, uh, sorry, I'm uh, Paul White. I'm uh, representing the Confederation of Passenger Transport, which is a trade association for bus and coach companies. Uh, Ian Doherty's uh, intervention there was a, a roller coaster ride for me, with <laughs> agreeing with parts and then violently disagreeing with others. Um, uh, I would just actually just touch on a couple of those points before I, I raise my point I had my hand up for. Um, it's good we have Robert Sampson here from uh, Transport Focus to maybe talk about um, passenger satisfaction surveys and the quality of bus compared to. Um, what the perception might be of actual the bus users, where the Scotland's um, bus companies are averaging about 90% passenger satisfaction, and how that compares to other modes, is, is uh, it's maybe not the the the, uh, the poor service that maybe uh, is a general perception on um, on uh, the the amount of money that bus companies receive from the government. I think that probably includes. Uh, concessionary fares scheme in there, and that is a huge commercial intervention into the commercial, huge intervention into the commercial market, and it means operators are receiving 57% reimbursement for every every journey. So that has to be taken into account. Uh, the reason I had my hand up was uh, I was at a um, bus and active travel forum today, organised by Transport Scotland. One of the speakers said, "No Transport Act in the last 70 years has." including the 1986 Act, which dere deregulated the market outside London, has uh, effectively addressed bus decline. Um, that's because the focus of those acts has been on regulatory models um, and strategies and hasn't actually put demand management at the centre. And I think that's a fear of this, this bill. Uh, um, and I, I disagree with Ellie, as you'd expect, <laughs> in, a, in a range of things, but in about forcing in local authorities to do anything. But um, it, one thing I would like to maybe see is targets introduced so that local authorities are working towards reducing congestion, improving average bus speeds, uh, improving um, modal shift to cleaner modes, is that something that the bill can look to include? I note that the, national, the government's national performance framework has removed the indicator that measured uh, congestion. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I disagree with that, and maybe the bill has a role in putting something back in there which will um, look to help us measure the impact that we see and uh, help address it. OK, Jonathan, your, your moment. Yeah, I think, I think we need to be very careful. Smoke screens. And to quote figures, that the bus industry, I think Ian said 33%. It's actually 43% is funded by 
by public subsidy. But for the uh, for that level of revenue, or at least I'm not quite sure what Ian's proposing, because Ian's 100% funded by the public sector. It's so maybe Ian's proposing they act. He works from nothing. Um, for that funding, they are, there are services are as provided, and it's kind of smoke screens like that that I think detract from the real issues, which is the, the kind of underlying economics of the market. And I think of all the things that we're talking about, it's all joined up about congestion, traffic control, those sorts of things. And to look at the bus industry in isolation, I think is is it's probably not what's required. It is part of the whole package. But I would guard against smoke screens. The other thing I would guard against is cross subsidy. Uh, it was mentioned that we can use profit-making bus services to pay for socially necessary services. So therefore, it's only bus users that pay for socially necessary services, not the taxpayer. And I say it should be the taxpayer that pays for socially necessary services. So I think in terms of cross subsidy, that's something to be always very careful of. John Mason. I Okay, so I'll, I'll definitely take you. Who, who, there was a gentleman at the back who's got the microphone. He's he's right. he's got it, so I'm going to have to let him speak. Right. First. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Derek Holden, re representing the Charter Institute of Logistics and Transport. Now. Um, we're the, the largest professional body trying to raise standards in the industries we're talking about, like buses and uh, the white vans that are clogging up the pavements and that sort of thing. So when we sat down to discuss this bill, we decided, as many of the people have already said, that legislation was absolutely the wrong tool to deal with these issues, that maybe the topics are right, but actually we're going to achieve absolutely nothing with the legislation. And we keep coming back to this word of partnership and the, the, the you know, <laughs> What, what we, we find with our schemes, like many of the bus operators here, we have benchmarking schemes on things like to try and work out why are they doing so well in Brighton? Why are they doing so well in Nottingham? What about uh, Norwich or whatever? And look at all the different types of areas. How do we raise the quality of, say, DPD to meet DHL or whatever? So these benchmarking schemes that we run to try and raise practice to the best um, are the sorts of things we, we look at. And we keep coming back to words like partnership. And we ask the questions, well, why are we not delivering these partnerships? And actually, we argued in our response to the committee that, in a written response, that actually one of the problems was actually making them statutory in the first place in 2001. They were actually doing better than that prior to then because a partnership is a voluntary arrangement where people work together to deliver shared goals and um, that by giving any individual stakeholder too much power, we actually weaken the ability to work well together. So there's some really important issues. And it was really interesting to observe the passion around um, for example, the workplace parking issue, which you know comes out of an area that's doing very well, like Nottingham, with great partnership working cultures between the bus operators and 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 and, 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 and the public authorities, and and so reinforcing what are the mechanisms that deliver that, and you know we we would observe and we think, well, actually there are things that need legislation. I think every single one of the political parties in the last election manifestos to the Scottish Parliament had some form of land value taxation mentioned in the manifesto. Why don't we have a land value tax for parking. You know, these are things that desperately need legislation, desperately need enacted. We've got apparently political commitments to do it, and yet they're not even in the bill. So these are the sorts of, when we sat down, we said, just scrap the bill. So anyway, we had a response. Uh, but it, it could be like the education bill in the Scottish Parliament recently, where actually the best thing the minister can do is say, well, we've had a really great debate about this, and the best way to go and do it is to do it by a different mechanism that rather, rather than legislation. But that's, that, that's our take on it. Uh, uh, so it sort of applies to all, all four themes, but I thought I'd come in on the bus one because it's such an important one around this, this par partnership culture. And let's, 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 go, let's go to Brighton. You know, yes, London's good, but there's, you know, there's great cultures existing, partnership working between local authorities and bus companies around the UK. Let's go and follow them and work out why they work and that take, grow, and grow those cultures and make them work better. OK, we're definitely not scrapping the bill with the amount of work we've just put into it. Sorry, you, 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 were, you were wanting to say something. Yeah, th thank you, convener. Uh, Robert Andrews, Stagecoach. Uh, just a couple of comments, if I may. You know, I think it was fascinating that you know, the, the discussion teased out you know, the, the cost of franchising and the cost of the London model and how that compares to the current spend per capita in Scotland. And bear in mind, Scotland's a predominantly rural country, so you'd naturally expect the spend per head of population to be higher. Uh, there's not been a lot of discussion about passengers. It's starting to come through you know, in the last, last couple of questions. And you know, picking up on Ian's point, you know, Paul quite rightly raised the, you know, the fact that customer satisfaction in the bus industry is actually pretty good. You know, it's 90%. We're not complacent. We want it to be better. 
uh, but a lot of sectors would, would kill for that. But you know, in terms of how we make it better, you know, what customers value most is punctuality and reliability. They want to have the peace of mind that when they leave their house and walk to the bus stop, you know, the vehicle is going to turn up on time. Yes, they can check it in the app to know whether it's on time or not, but that's what they want. You know, we, we get people commute into our cities from whether it's Ayrshire into Glasgow, Fife into Edinburgh. They don't know when to leave the house because they don't know what bus or coach to get because they don't know how long it's going to take to actually get through the traffic and into the, the urban centres. And that is a big disincentive to people actually thinking about how, how they travel. They'll sit in the car and listen to the radio and bemoan the congestion, not realising they're actually contributing significantly to it. In terms of Sheila's point, if I may, you know, a lot of, we operate a lot of coaches. I uh, don't apologise for that. On the longer distance services, it gives the right quality. Kate's comment about vehicles being uncomfortable. I don't know what type of vehicle she was travelling on, but coaches are more comfortable for longer distance trips. Where coaches tend to end up on shorter trips tends to be because it's marginal services operating off the back of school contracts. School contracts are generally specified by local authority, trying to get the lowest price, trying to get the most number of kids in, and it's a sort of by byproduct of that. So some of those issues are actually in the gift of the current the current environment. Colin, did you want to come in with a... A, a brief observation, I have to say there's been a, a, a massive breakout of unity, I think, tonight between even people who believe in municipal bus companies and the bus companies themselves. I think everybody's united in the fact that the current transport bill won't make one iota of difference to the decline in bus usage at the moment. I think it's absolutely clear, and what we need is some radical proposals to come forward. And I was struck by the point that Ian made uh, around but regulation was not the answer, but then you proposed the sort of squire model that we have for rail now, with the best one in the world is highly a, a ringing success with 60% of those targets um, not met and the worst performance figures today uh, since since the, the current franchise was handed out. So what do you specifically propose? If that's not regulation, what, what is it? What do you specifically propose if more regulation isn't the answer? Because the two best examples, I suppose, are, are Lothians, where we have municipal ownership of buses, and London, where we have regulation. I mean, every route is regulated, so what is the specifics that you're saying should happen to, to reverse that if it's not regulation? I, I'm going to let Ian, Ian, Ian come in. I'm, I'm, we're going to have to sort of be careful that buses don't dominate the whole evening. Ian, do you, do you want to come back on that? Um, a response to that challenge could definitely take all evening. I mean, there is a difference between the economic regulation and the industry as a whole, which Jonathan and Tom have talked about, and... Um, a different regulatory framework, which we already have through the Traffic Commissioner, for example, for basic standards of vehicles. I mean, we could, we could choose to have a different set of quality standards to permit operators to, to operate. Um, and, you know, on the Squire Railway point, um, I challenge you to, to travel around in any other regional railway in Great Britain and find a standard passenger quality that looks anything like ScotRail, mm -hmm. with the exception of the railways that Transport for London operate, because they have the same the same kind of view. And I think it's quite good we've got stretching targets we don't meet sometimes, actually, because that's what keeps people's eyes focused on the prize. What I did want to say, and come back to again, what I said at the very beginning about um, increasing bus patronage as being the single most important thing that we all have to do, just a little bit of note of caution about passenger experience surveys, whichever mode they're on. And my academic colleagues will have the same view, no doubt, about university league tables. They measure particular things because of the questions they ask and the questions they ask them of. What we're talking about here is finding non-users of the bus mm -hmm. that we need to get back on the bus and by definition asking people that are already on the bus doesn't capture them and we need to think about that i mean think about why people are not using bus services when they're there and what we need to do to make them better so that they do you keep catching me out ian i think you've come to the end of your point and you go on to another one so i'm going to take two more things on buses and then we're going to move on to low admission zone so the gentleman with the blue tie and then the gentleman with the yellow and blue tie yeah. Uh, Robert Sampson, Transport Focus. F three quick points. One thing we've said in the evidence to the committee, and I agree with what Ian said earlier, there has to be a strategy going through whatever structure you come up with to look at known and infrequent users of bus service and actually get them onto the bus, actually improve bus numbers. In the ScotRail franchise, you have the National Rail Passenger Survey, you also have the Squire regime that looks at both quality of and quantity of mechanisms of the passenger experience. The Bus Industry Transport Scotland Regional Transport Partnerships fund the Bus Passenger Survey, 10,000 passengers a year, actually looks at, yeah, I take the point, existing passengers only, it doesn't look at 
the people who aren't using the bus. They're also developing action plans of bus companies to actually take those results seriously and how do we actually improve it? And compared with the, the rail, with only 2,000 passengers a year being surveyed, there's 10,000 in the, the bus industry, action plans being developed. And what comes through in all the survey, like, what's the main, what's the biggest criticism you've got about current bus services? Punctuality. And wherever we use a survey, what, what's causing the punk, poor punctuality? Congestion. The number one thing that passengers say just now it can be improved is congestion. That's the biggest barrier to punctuality. Congestion. Wherever we actually do this, survey, whether it's rural or urban areas, congestion. You're, you're all ignoring my waving pen. I'll, oh, I'll, I'll <laughs> encourage you that we've got two more subjects which I want to get through. So, yeah, you're the last one on buses. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, Richard Hall, um, Managing Director of Lady and Buses, um, subject of much debate, I know, through this REC committee hearing. Um, a couple of points um, that I think we need to get clarified. Um, firstly, we need to start changing the language we use um, around bus. And, you know, we talked about active travel. Bus is part of active travel. We need to stop talking about passengers and we need to start talking about customers. Um, because we're evolving our models, like the high street is evolving, and we need to meet those challenges. So, as politicians and officers and commercial operators, you know, we need to change that. There's a couple of key points around the, the London model that's being talked about before I come very, very quickly to um, the Lothian model. Um, some key things around that. Um, London does not deliver quality bus services. OK, um, you know, I speak with experience having worked down there for, you know, some three and a half years. It delivers very poor quality bus services. What it delivers is high frequency bus services. OK, and they don't innovate. They don't deliver the quality that bus operators deliver in Scotland. Um, you know, that is very, very clear. So the, the customer experience is not great. Drivers that don't interact with the customers, buses that are no different to buses that were built in the late 80s, early 90s, with the exception of, you know, technical engineering development. TfL um, is facing um, a massive operating deficit in 2019 of £1 billion, pounds, OK? Um, and currently, it receives annually £591 million grant from central government to fund its operation of services. We did some work in uh, Lothian some years ago and we presented it to the City of Edinburgh Council um, at the cost they would have to provide to us to operate the same level of service. Um, and they were quite scared by that. And, you know, that's something we can update and present if wanted. So £591 million to grant fund um, TfL to run bus services in London. That's a massive, massive number. And, you know, where's that going to come from? Um, there's a couple of uh, key things here. We need to destigmatize bus. Um, the lady over there spoke about Glasgow. And actually, Glasgow is stigmatized socially. People in cities um, across Scotland stigmatize Glasgow. And that's not right. That's not the bus operator's fault. It's not the public transport operator's fault. It's a societal thing. It needs to change, and change it must. Bus in Scotland, in the last figures um, produced by Transport Scotland themselves, carry 380 million people um, per annum, OK? And rail carried... I, I am waving. Mm. I'm, I've, yeah. gi I've given you a bit of leeway. OK. We're beginning to get into a bit of a thing that's going to stop us talking about low emission zones okay, and I've just the got other side. One more point, convener. One more can. point, Thank you. And, and, um, and then you will definitely have missed the bus. Um, the, the final point, convener, thank you for that extra time, much appreciated, um, is that actually the model, the ownership model, doesn't make any difference. Lothian is an entirely commercial business. It makes the same commercial decisions that first group make, that stagecoach make, that independently owned bus operators make. It makes those for the right decisions for its customers and for its ongoing business security. Right, and, 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 and I did promise we'd move on with buses. I'm really sorry, Corinne, and I know I'll have to meet the wrath of, of you at the next committee meeting, but we're going to move on to low emission zones, and we have a short time to do it. 
Um, this, would apply, this part of the bill would allow local authorities to create, modify and revoke low emission zones in Scotland. Does, who has a view on this? We've heard the, the, uh, the academics on it. Does somebody have a view on it? Uh, yes. Tom Flanagan very from... Short, sorry, uh, the point is, very, very short points. I, I don't mean to be difficult, because I would like to touch on smart ticketing. <laughs> Tom Flanagan, Director of TACTRAN. Uh, just to pick up a point which I think Kate made about uh, making sure that the implementation of measures to support LEZs are across a wider geographical area. Uh, at the moment, funding is being made available to those authorities who have to deliver LEZs, quite rightly. Um, but if you take the case of Dundee, which is the first in the queue in the TACTRAN area, it's, it's a very compact city. And quite a number of the measures that need to be introduced to support uh, the LE said could be park and ride, which could be across the Tay Road Bridge or perhaps even in Angus. So um, we'd urge the government to uh, make sure that the funding is available for measures, uh, not just in the LE said, but on the wider travel to work area as well. Uh, the second point um, is around uh, incentives, uh, particularly for modal shift. So we talked about charging. Um, I hope the LEZs will bring in the opportunity to actually think about incentives as they do uh, in North America where there's a commuter tax incentive where people are given tax incentives to actually shift mode, uh, whether that's uh, rapid transit, public transport or in particular active travel. So we start to think about incentives for people to shift mode, uh, particularly towards uh, electric uh, vehicles or electric bikes uh, and, and similar such uh, modes of travel. Thank you. Jimmy, you want to ask a question and there's a gentleman at the back who'd like to bring in. You know, and I'll keep it quick. Um, I, it's interesting, the LEZ thing has actually been one of those few things that have had real genuine cross-party support. And there's been some differences in terms of how it should operate, the grace periods, what type of vehicles, and there's lots of discussion around the technicalities of delivery of it. But it genuinely has had cross-party support. That, therefore, I'm saddened and disappointed if there's any academic evidence, and I do genuinely believe in evidence-led policy, that suggests that it won't make a huge difference. Um, and I'd like to think it, it did. Otherwise, why are we doing it? So what I would say is, and I would ask the question is, um, does the bill get it right? Uh, what should central government decide and what should be left to local authorities? Because there's been a lot of discussion and I've heard so many different views from so many different panels and experts on this. Who, and I apologize, John. Um, who, you know, what, what should be decided centrally? What should be the standardized metrics? that all local authorities in the five zones have to implement, and what flexibility should be given to local authorities to make local decisions that are right for those cities. And it's really unclear in my mind at the moment what we should centralise and what we should devolve. Jamie, the short point, I think, from Kate in response. And, and, and then I'll come to you, John, if you want to come in. OK, Kate. <laughs> And then the, the gentleman, there's two gentlemen at the back. So okay, take. thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I would share um, concern that the, the, the reviews of existing LEZs are, are not glowing reports. Um, but I think without access to concrete evidence on that, it'd be something I would go to look up. Um, I, I think there could be a couple of reasons for that. One is that obviously transport is not the only source of air quality problems. Um, and... Um, those are perhaps not being tackled in the LEZs, so they're not being so the sources of pollution are not being fully addressed. And I don't know this for a fact, but I sort of surmised that perhaps the issues that we've had with car manufacturers trying to gain the emission standards could have resulted in LEZs not delivering the expected results in the period in question. Okay, so I'm going to take the, the gentleman who I accused of wearing a grey shirt and he told me it wasn't first. Well, I said it was nearly grey. Um, uh, so it was actually in response to a, a point that Dr Pangborn made in her um, initial, initial remarks at the outset, where she said that there's, a, there's an aspect of uh, social progressiveness about this measure to take, bear in mind, which is that people who have the least money might have the oldest vehicles, which are likely to be the least clean. If that's true for individuals and private cars, it is probably also true for transport providing organisations, that those with the least money probably have the older and least clean and efficient vehicles. And I mentioned the community transport sector again, because there are a lot of minibuses in city centre and areas where there are air quality, 
uh, management zones, which are trying to get maximum use out of the assets they have for the minimum amount of money. And it's over a fifth of community transport providers in Scotland are have an annual operating cost of about £20,000 or less. So all I would ask is that it's considered that the community transport sector has equivalent access to the funds that are being made available for retrofit and upgrade, because otherwise they might find it very difficult to meet the Euro 6 emissions standard, even if that's not the most, uh, you know, the best standard in itself, it's still quite demanding for vehicles which have a very long usage length and which maybe arrive second hand as well. Sorry, is it Gavin? I see. Sorry, you are hiding in the shadows. We saw you earlier this morning. Gavin, and, and, and then back to the centre. Hi, everyone. I'm Gavin Thompson. I'm the air pollution campaigner at Friends of the Air Scotland, and I spoke to the committee this morning about low emission zones. Um, and some of the points I was uh, going to say were, were just made, actually, about um, poor performance of uh, low emission zones in the past, or about um, the Euro standards not uh, being as good. This is going back some years, and the wide-scale fraud we now know about. Um, Volkswagen are the, the only company, but there's a you know, uh, deep distrust now about uh, all main uh, car manufacturers, because many of them are using similar techniques about um, lab testing rather than real world testing which which skews the air pollution anyway um so i was just going to say that that um some of the uh, evidence on low emission zones in the past hasn't been great but in terms of reducing air pollution in urban centers there's very few other policies that have been as effective now i think it, it needs to be implemented hand in hand with a lot of the policies we've talked about here this evening a workplace parking levy to reduce congestion and moving people onto buses um, and just a quick point as well that Electric cars aren't the answer. I'm sure everyone knows this, but electric cars aren't the answer to air pollution. You get a lot of uh, particulate pollution from tire wear and brake wear. Um, we need to be moving people out of private cars, walking, cycling, public transport. Um, and electric cars are part of the solution, but um, certainly won't, won't stop the air pollution. Uh, and the final point on, on low emission zones in the middle here. Thank you, Andrew Jarvis, again from first. Um, in, in terms of national or local, the technical standards definitely have to be national. Um, particularly, some operators will have vehicles that, within their daily duty cycle, will operate in two or perhaps even three or maybe even four of the low emission zones, I mean, particularly when you think of the longer distance services. So, so that, that's pretty critical. In terms of the local, then, I guess the, the area and also the time restrictions uh, seem, seems most sensible. In terms of the, the another reason why the low emission zones won't necessarily work properly or, or could not work, we've we've had a lot of data presented to us from SEPA, um, and that that's to do with you will only achieve the the reductions if the average speed is appropriate. So if the average speed falls below a certain level, a Euro six bus or lorry doesn't achieve the level that it needs to. The heat isn't there in, in the engine and the exhaust system. And then finally, in terms of commercial vehicles, it's a it's a real world testing environment. It's not a laboratory test. And the vehicles then also record that in real time. So if there's a fault with the system and the emissions fall uh, or, or go higher than a, a set level, the vehicle goes into shutdown and stops. So it, it, the, the commercial vehicle Euro 6 measurement is nothing like a, a, a private car measure. OK, that, that's interesting. Thank you. And we're now going to move on to the final session, or, or, which is on smart ticketing. And this bill would allow Scottish ministers to specify a national technological standard for the implementation and operation of smart ticketing arrangement. It, it provides local transport authorities with additional powers to develop and deliver smart ticketing arrangements and schemes. And there's a member of the committee who always, when I, we get on to smart ticketing, produces his wallet, not to give me money, but to produce five cards to say that all of them work across Scotland, all for different reasons, and why can't he have one? So he's not here tonight, Stuart Stevenson, but uh, he gets a mention. So smart ticketing has been challenging the introduction. Um, who would like to start off? Yeah, the gentleman at the back. Hi, my name's Ralph Roberts. I'm the managing director of McGill's Buses in the west of Scotland, but I also chair the Scottish Smart and Integrated Ticketing Steering Group, um, where all modes are represented apart from air and tram. Uh, and Scottish Government as well. Um, we already have the standard. The standard is called ITSO, um, and that is a standard that is used for multi-operator, multi-modal ticketing. Um, 
the standard obviously existed in London, and TfL used it quite for some years. And the problem has not been, in that sense, the technology. The problem has been the commercial allocation and collection of the revenue. And in the patchwork quilt that we have up and down the UK, it makes it very, very difficult because we have a number of sticking plasters around about the uh, country in terms of service provision, commercial offering. Most journeys happen locally within a network on bus. And when you have a journey between rail and bus, you have multi-modal operation. Now, you have in the east of the country, in Scotland, a significant uh, multi-operator and multi-modal situation called One Ticket. And in the west, you have Zone Card, and both of these have existed for some time. So there is quite significant multi-operator, multi-modal integrated tickets in existence in the country. However, they both differ. In technology terms, the difficulty is generally with the back offices and the integration of technology rather than the technology itself. It's the adoption of it. There are a number of difficulties there. And in the debates that have happened and the evidence sessions that have happened, I've been intrigued because I feel that what we're talking about is more the commercial model and how we can get fares lower and how we can get uptake up and how we can get footfall up rather than talking about the technology. Technology is a barrier. It's not all about a piece of plastic. Mobile ticketing is here, and it is way beyond. The uptake is way beyond what plastic ever was in Scotland. So mobile ticketing can do much more. We have people standing at bus stops all over Scotland looking at their phone to tell them their bus is there in two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, whatever. So technology is moving on all of the time. And I fear that when we talk about technology and pieces of plastic, that we're looking backwards rather than forwards. Okay, and, and I think one of the points I, I think the gentleman wants to come in next to you was that there will always be a requirement perhaps for people who don't have mobile phones or, or cards to make payments to have a, a, a situation where, say in children's case, they could have a, a plastic card with, with, with prepaid to allow them to take buses. So the gentleman... Yeah. Yes, Der Derek Holden again from uh, Charters of Logistics and Transport. I mean, this, this is an issue that has kept coming up time and time again. And you know, Ian said 10 years ago he was looking at a scheme at which 10 years ago we're saying was grossly out of date, designed irrelevant for Scotland. And surely 10 years on, we've made no progress. And so, you know, it's about time to stop and say, look, these scheme designs were never going to work. They haven't worked. It's actually been a massively anti-public transport strategy, as has been said already youngsters just pick up the phone and get Uber instead because they can't be bothered with the ticketing on the buses and this sort of thing. We need to sort this out. We actually need to have a, a scheme now that the, 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 the public policy has a hugely important role in service design in terms of saying what should the fares be, uh, road equivalent tariff on the ferries or sorting out the rare fares across Scotland. These have been massively important and really positive fares design that the Scottish Government's implemented in recent years. Focus on that, sort out the fares. There's 101 technologies could be used by 101 providers to deliver, those, to deliver those services in different ways across the country. Once we know what the social policy is, commercial operators can then uh, you know, say, right, the price for delivering that is, and it can be delivered. So you know, let's get real, let's, 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 just, let's just move on from, from that. So it is it's really one provision that I think you know, we need to look very seriously at in the bill and say is this needed. OK, I Ian's going to come in and prove me that Stuart Stevenson is here. Ian. I, wanted, I think it was Tom that raised the issue about definitions and terminology and ticketing at the beginning and Derek's just raised that. Um, this is my wallet, this is my ticket from where I was on holiday last week. It's a magnetic stripe ticket. That technology is how many decades old? That's smart. I could buy that at literally 10,000 outlets in the city I was in. It gets me on anything with wheels to go anywhere I want. That's a smart ticket. We can't even do that. It's smart because it's integrated, not because it's technologically advanced. So we have to be very careful about the definitions and not confuse the dash for technology, which is inevitably likely to be out of date with the simple things we still don't get right. Ali. Yeah, I mean, I just want to concur with um, Ian and some of the other comments. When we sat in on the evidence session on the 3rd of October, the guy from the Confederation of Passenger Transport was bumbling on about why it taken 14 years to get nowhere, and we're not going to waste another 14 years to get nowhere. We need to this bill to deliver integrated, smart or not smart ticketing um, across Scotland. In Glasgow, 
The issue with the zone card is that it's impossible to buy. You have to go to the Buchanan bus station. It's more, it's, it's expensive and um, it always expires on a Saturday. So no matter which day of the week you buy, it expires on a Saturday. It's a complete waste of money. And how do you get to the Buchanan bus station in the first place? You need to be able to buy these tickets everywhere, 10,000 out, outlets across the city. But the most important thing is the cost. And a daily price cap is absolutely essential. And as far as we understand, that's only possible to deliver that through a franchising framework. That's an argument for franchising in itself, if it will enable us to deliver this integrated smart ticket that is so long overdue. And it needs to be affordable. And in Glasgow, you could even be arguing, you could sidestep the whole ticketing uh, debate altogether if the public transport was free. And they are doing that in other European um, countries, in Estonia, for example. And I think we do need to be looking at something that radical to shift people out of their cars and onto public transport to the extent that we need. I was very good. I was waving it quite emphatically. <laughs> uh, Tom, you want to come in? Yes, it reiterates a point I made earlier and kind of reiterates that point and takes us back to the bus debate. There are certain things that it is much easier to deliver in a franchised regime. So integrated ticketing, and I think integrated ticketing is what we really want. It's not necessarily smart, it doesn't have to be smart, but it has to be integrated and it has to be price competitive. And in a gross cost franchise regime, that is easier to deliver. Different vehicles, accessible coaches that you can actually get a wheelchair on without a lift, they're easier to deliver in a franchise regime, but I would also reiterate that that comes at a higher cost to the public sector and therefore you've got to think whether or not you can pay for it and where you'll get that money from. Andrew. I mean, already uh, only 29% of passengers and customers in Glasgow pay with cash. So already we're at 71% of people paying with a smart means of travel. Now, whether that's smart card for concessionary travel, whether that's mobile ticketing, whether that's... We've got a universal thing called a credit and a debit card, which can be on a mobile phone as well. It's, it's those methods of payment that people want. They don't want another... They don't want transport tokens in their wallet. They want to just pay with their credit and debit card or their Android phone or their Apple phone. That's what's happening in London. Forget Oyster. Oyster's 10 years ago. Um, so in, in terms of daily capping or weekly capping, our, our ticket machine systems can absolutely do that now. Um, it's just a case of working on the commercials, and we're working on a project to do that within Scotland within the next 12 months. Um, so it'll be just ourselves, um, but obviously we'll also talk to other operators uh, as we go along. So the, the daily and weekly capping, you don't need a regulated market, and that's been delivered, I think, in the West Midlands as we speak by commercial operators. And, and I think that that's probably a good place to bring it to a close. I'd just say on the Oyster card, I think it is important to remember that there are some people who will need Oyster cards because they don't have bank cards and, and telephones. And I think that point's been made to the committee and we've picked it up on several occasions. So we have come to the end of the event. Thank you very much for all your input. I think the committee, uh, certainly I and all the committee members here, have learned something and found this evening incredibly invaluable. I would like to apologise now before we go off air, as it were, to say that I'm no David Dimbleby. I've tried my best to bring you all in. For those that I didn't bring in, I apologise for anyone who cu I cut short. I'm sorry, but there is a time scale and I am 51 seconds over it. So thank you very much and thank you very much for your time. Do stay and mingle if you want. Thank you.